we're back, and um, we have Bill Mingus um, doing our oxygen demonstration. And Bill's had cluster headaches for decades, right, Bill? Decades? Yes, um, over two decades. As a over two fact, decades. I was a late and um, he's been an advocate for many years. He's an, he is considered an oxygen expert. So if you want to know about oxygen use, it's good to check with Bill. We're fortunate to have him with us today, and I think everyone's gonna learn a lot. Feel free to ask questions, um, and Bill will be happy to answer, answer all of them. So with that, Bill, go ahead. Okay, uh, briefly introducing myself. I'm Bill Mangus, I'm from Western North Carolina, in case you can't tell by the accent. Uh, Several years ago, in the late 90s, I was diagnosed with cluster headaches. I was lucky I got diagnosed pretty quick, but I didn't know anything about oxygen. And I took a trip to a meet and greet in Iowa, and somebody introduced me to it where I kind of just kind of ignored it. And a light bulb went off my head and said, this works. So like I do everything else, I dove into it trying to figure out what was right, what was wrong, what was the best. And in my conversations with people on the old clusterheadaches.com message board, somebody said, well, if you go buy your own regulator, get one with the highest flow rate you can. You can never have too much. So that's what I did. And I discovered that a high flow rate made my life a whole lot better. So I kind of made it my calling to try and educate people on that. And while nothing works for everybody, high flow oxygen will basically save my life. And I'm gonna try and go through the basics. I know that probably many people have already uh, know the basics, but in case we've got some people out there that are not familiar with the mechanics of oxygen, I'm gonna go through that part of it as well. You might see the handle sticking up back here. The camera is not good or wide angle, but this is a medical oxygen tank. It is a D cylinder. The tank behind me is an E and it's about twice as big, twice as tall. They use regulators like this called a post type regulator. They slide down right over the post. You tighten them up by hand, seals made, you stick the mask on there, turn it on, turn the tank on, and you're in business. It's pretty simple once you do it once or twice. I'd like to point out a different type of regulator. It's one we'll talk about a little bit further in a little bit. This is a regulator with a disc fitting or a power takeoff. That is for a, the, the much vaulted demand valve. And we're going to go through that as well. But I just thought while I had it, I'd point that difference out. For those of you that have tried oxygen but not had much success, you may have been given by your O2 supplier a mask much like this with a small bag, holes in the side of the mask to keep you from suffocating, much like you'd see on an ambulance. Well, while this is better than nothing, it is not optimum for our use. I recommend, and most anybody who has tried it would recommend an O2 cluster kit. You'll notice the bag is like three times as big. The inlet, I have removed the mask portion that goes around the mouth and nose. I prefer a mouthpiece like that. I'm kind of claustrophobic and I don't like the mask on my face. This works very well. Uh, it's my go-to. Touching on another type of regulator, and I wish I had a tank to demonstrate it on. There are large medical tanks, M tanks, and oxygen tanks for welding that use this type of fitting here it screws onto a valve on the top of the tank. This is a welding regulator. And while I am not making any recommendations, 
this can be a alternative for high flow oxygen on a budget. And I guess I should say that I'm not a medical professional. I am just a guy with cluster headaches that decided to make oxygen his life's calling. So I'm sharing my personal experiences with you. Consult a doctor, consult your medical professional, whoever, to make sure that this is right for you. Now, going on, I've heard a lot of people talk about oxygen and they didn't like dragging a tank around. Well, I'm gonna get that out of the way real quick. I want to be sure that that's not an excuse for you not to try it. I held up a D tank just a minute ago and inside this little convenient carrying case is a D tank. It sits behind the driver's seat of my vehicle all the time, even though I haven't needed it in over a year. I took many, many vacations with little D tanks strapped on my shoulder. I went to many sporting events. I did not let cluster headaches stop me from enjoying my life. Nobody knows this isn't a cooler until you get out the tank. So don't say you have to lug a tank around and use that as an excuse. A lot of times people ask me to say, why does oxygen not work for me? Well, a lot of times they don't know how to use it. Now, well, granted, it's not a one size fits all method. I'm gonna give you a couple of methods that I use, the ones that I prefer. That is not all inclusive. There are other methods that other people use. Uh, I've tried some of them. Some of them don't really fit my method of aborting. I can't concentrate enough to do it their way. That doesn't say that they're wrong and I'm right. Absolutely not. Talk to other people that use oxygen and figure out what's right for you. Now I'm gonna give a quick demonstration on how to figure out whether your oxygen flow is enough. So I'm going to demonstrate on this little small tank here, I'm gonna do a little demo of hooking it up to start with. The tank is now hooked up. I have tightened it down and all I need is a key to turn it on. If you're an oxygen user and you've been suffering, keep one of these in your pocket. There's nothing like frustration getting to the tank and the key's gone. Trust me, you'll sit there in pain, swearing up and down, you'll never be without one of these again. Now I'm gonna hook up the cluster mask and try to demonstrate a flow rate difference. So I'm gonna have to put this down. I have this tank set on 15 liters a minute and I'm gonna breathe like I would if I was trying to abort. You see the bag is flattening out and I'm sorry it's not on camera, I'll try to hold it differently. I'm not getting all the oxygen that I need. That's what I call outrunning your regulator. If you can outrun your regulator, you need a higher flow. Just like that. I turned the flow up to 25. You see, I still can outrun the bag, but it's keeping up with me a little bit better. I'll give it a chance to fill up. I'm still out running, but I'm getting 10 liters more a minute. So that's the first thing. If you're using 15 liters a minute with a good mask, a good delivery system, and you're not out running, you're not having to wait, then your flow is right for you. If you are running out and consistently having to wait for the bag to fill for you to breathe, you could benefit from a higher flow. Now high flow regulators up to 25 are pretty easy to find. I have a PDF file with links on everything I talk about here today 
And if you'll email me, and I'll give that email out here in a little bit, I will send you that PDF file with clickable links on it and also a graphic of the tanks and certain other things like that. Glad to do it, no problem. You could buy regulators that go past 25. Your oxygen supplier will tell you, no, you can't, but you can. On one of the links, it's, I think it's WT Farley, you can get a, 45, a 40 liter a minute regulator. And even I can't outrun that. It doesn't look any different than this regulator right here. It costs about 60 bucks. So you can get them. It's the, like I said, it's the one I keep in my vehicle. Now, every, uh, a lot of people will ask, well, what about a demand valve? Well, the demand valve is great, but you don't have to have a demand valve to get your high flow. First of all, if you're not out running your current system and you're getting aborts fairly well, you, uh, a demand valve's not going to help you. But I do have a demand valve. I was lucky enough to score one for a good price. They're not cheap. And I love it, but do I absolutely have to have it? No. Uh, we are talking on the message board one day on uh, Cluster Buster. Somebody asked about a demand valve, and I gave a dip, uh, the, uh, my take between a 40 liter a minute regulator and a demand valve. If I was sitting in this chair right now and I started having a cluster headache, I would not step over one to get to the other. In other words, I view them both as being the same. The demand valve shines when you wake up at two in the morning and you need oxygen right now. You have it sitting beside your bed, you flip the tank on, you'll grab it and start your breathing regimen, which I'm gonna demonstrate in just a couple minutes. You don't have to fumble with a dial, setting your flow rate, worrying about anything else. As long as you don't run out, you're gonna have oxygen. It does conserve a little bit, but to me, it's not, that's not the biggest thing, the biggest benefit. The biggest benefit is you don't have to think about anything past turning the tank on and grabbing it and going. Now I'm gonna demonstrate a demand valve right now. They're, they look a little bit different. You'll notice this is just a just one solid piece right there with a thick hose coming out of it. And I have a different type of demand valve right here. This is more common than this. This is a European, mostly found in Europe, I found. These are fairly common. They're made by Allied Healthcare, and I have some links on my PDF file, which will get you started in your search for a demand valve. You can also get lucky and find them on eBay every once in a while, which I have bought some and passed them along to folks. So if you're lucky enough to find one, jump on it as long as it's not too high a price. All right. I make sure that I always have a key. Stretch cord attached to the regulator. All right, I'm gonna turn this tank on. And all I'm gonna do is breathe. As long as I pull, it gives me oxygen. It stops when I stop. This is what I would call a Cadillac versus, I don't know, Chevrolet. Both will get you to the same point. This is just a little bit nicer. I love it, but it's not necessary. Don't think you have to buy three or $400 rig just to get a Bortz with high flow, but this is nice. Now, I'm gonna use this to demonstrate a couple of breathing techniques. Uh, the two I use, and I swap them back and forth depending on how I'm feeling, whether one's working and the other one's not, you know, sometimes that happens. And I'd like to say I've only had two times when oxygen has failed to abort cluster headache. And if you want to scare somebody like me, have oxygen not abort when it has consistently for years. Uh, I can't explain why it didn't work those two times. I can only say that I burnt through two oxygen tanks and two 
uh, so many nasal sprays and I finally got it to stop. It did help keep the pain level to a kind of manageable level, but it did not abort. Now, I try not to think about those two times. So it can happen, but those are only two times in 18 years that I've been using oxygen. So I count that pretty good. The first method I use, and this is gonna assume that you're not starving for oxygen. You have a regulator and a rig that will give you the oxygen that you need, you personally need, and you're not gonna run out. The first method I use is a deep breath in and a deep breath out and doing an abdominal crunch to try and get all the remaining air out of your lungs. That can help because if you think about it, there's still air in your lungs when you exhale. Uh, that dilutes the incoming 100% pure oxygen. Not a lot, but some. And it will keep the effectiveness down just a tick. You'll notice if you will try to get all the air out, which you can't get all of it, I don't think, but if you try to get just a little bit more out and then breathe deeply, fill your lungs up, you might notice a little bit of difference in your abort time. Using one of these two methods, I can usually wake up from a deep sleep, grab a tank and abort in five minutes and be rolling back, trying to get back to sleep. That's not typical of everyone, but a lot of people will find that. Now the first, I'm gonna demonstrate the first method. Uh, I'm trying to do an abdominal crunch, trying to get the air out. Some people find it's better to be standing to do this. I like to sit. I guess it just depends on you. So I'm gonna start. I think you can get the idea from that. And oxygen does dry you out, so pardon me for taking it. The next method I like to use is hyperventilating. Now you may say, well, how do you hyperventilate when you have a limited flow? Well, this is once again, assuming that you have a proper flow and a proper rig to use. I know there are a couple of methods out there that use hyperventilation with room air and then taking a gulp of oxygen, holding it 30 seconds. Myself personally, I have not had any success with that. I know people that do, more power to them, but I guess I'm just a high flow junkie. When I'm in pain, I want that oxygen flowing. So I'm gonna try to de demonstrate hyperventilation with oxygen. And it takes work, and this tank is just about out, so I'm trying to try to make it quick. What I'm going to do is I'm going to inhale and exhale as fast as I possibly can. And this is almost like a good trot or jog down the street uphill as far as how it feels to you after you do it for a couple minutes, because it is work to do. Uh, but it can very much help in your board times. I'm trying to do my abdominal crunch as fast as I can and get it out and get it in. If you start feeling lightheaded, it means you're doing it right. You will start feeling lightheaded. I'm obviously not going to go that far with it. I don't really want to feel lightheaded and not have a cluster headache. So I hope you can get the idea from that. Once again, these are the two methods that I prefer and have had great success with and have talked to many people. That does not mean that all other methods are invalid. Just because Bill says it doesn't make it the absolute. Ask people, observe, talk, you know, talk it out. You might find something that I don't do effective for you and vice versa. I'm always trying new ways, but these are my two, two tried and true ways. I'm a high flow junkie when my head hurts. I want 
that oxygen to be coming fast as I can. Now, once again, I will forward to y'all, to anybody that asks, a PDF with the links for everything I talk about today. Uh, that's not the only place you can get them with the exception of the cluster mask. Now, I spoke to uh, Darren Johnson, DJ, clusterheadaches.com. The website is going to show that those O2 cluster masks are out of stock. He's at work right now. Tracking shows that he just got a shipment of his back ordered parts. He's not home to make doubly sure. But he said if that's what that shipment is, they'll be back in stock tonight. When he gets home, he'll switch the uh, sign on the clusterheadaches.com store and they'll be back in stock. They're not but 25 bucks and it's the best 25 bucks an oxygen user can spend. And I will say that I get absolutely no product placement or monetary compensation from anybody for anything. I'm just telling you what works for me. You might ask, where do I find a good 25 liter minute regulator? Amazon. They got them for, I think it's $26.95, something like that. And you can get one with a disc fitting, which you need for a demand valve. And I guess I should demonstrate. I can't. I'm going to lift this thing up. Bill, it's, Bill, did you want to be interrupted for questions or do you want to wait until the end? Uh, let me finish just a couple more minutes and then okay. I'll take any okay. questions y'all okay. have. Because if Very I went to my train of thought, I'm, thought, I'm dead Very no good. more. Go on. Okay. Uh, this is how the demand valve hose screws in. It screws into that fitting. And you absolutely have to have that in order to use a demand valve. They also have these demand valve regulators on Amazon for, mm, I think it was $27. They're great. Would I use them on an ambulance where I had to use them 24 hours a day? Probably not, but for our use, they're fantastic. And I wanted to touch on the uh, welding tank, M tank, medical tank type regulator. You can get these same type of regulators with a proper fitting on it, custom made with high flow for a, a medical tank, a large M tank or a welding tank. Now, given the fact that some people, a lot of us now are on a limited budget, I have used these. They are inexpensive welding regulators. Uh, would I want to operate a welding shop with it? Absolutely not. But for my use, it's fantastic. You can have so much flow out of this, it'll blow the bag up. You have to just set it and forget it, turn the tank on for your flow rate leave it there. But I think I gave $25, $26 for this at uh, Harbor Freight when they had them. Now Amazon has them for 25, 30 bucks. Uh, limited budget, got a welding tank in the garage and you want to try that? There you go. And I will touch on safety for just a minute or two. Please. Do not smoke around oxygen. I, when I was a smoker, I did not smoke in the room that the tanks were in, regardless. Uh, and I was a heavy smoker at one time. I kept the tanks, or my, my tank for abortives in my bedroom. I did not smoke in my bedroom, ever. And that's just being overly cautious, maybe. But I didn't want to become a crispy critter on the six o'clock news. And if you've ever seen a tank explode or an oxygen fire, that'll make a believer out of you. If you go to an oxygen supplier, these are the little O-rings on the post type regulators. Have them close by, keep a few, because there's nothing like changing tanks, turning it on, and the thing's leaking out and you can't get any flow. Plus, it's not safe. So keep a few of these around. There are also some other tricks and tips that I can give you 
and I don't really know what people are wanting to do right now or want to talk about. So, and I'm sure I've left something off and probably somebody will remind me. So please, by all means, let's ask some questions. All right, let me take a look over here. We've got, uh, what kind of apparatus, apparatus am I using? I hope that I have explained that pretty clear. Uh, if I haven't, if you have some kind of more clarification on that, please ask specifically. I hope I've covered it well enough to where it explains it. Uh, it's best to stay on for the oxygen a while after it aborts. Sometimes, yes. Uh, I'm kind of an odd duck that sometimes I will, I can feel the headache for lack of a better term. I call it melting away, melting it away and just kind of, I can just feel it drifting down and I'll stop with the oxygen and just let it go on down. It's done its job. Sometimes I do have to stay on it until it's completely gone. And if it's, if I have that type of feeling, I will stay on it for a little bit longer. I found that if it's going to come back, it's going to come back, whether I stay on it or not. Other people report that yes, staying on it for a few minutes after the abort helps keep them away. I can't say that that's true for me, but enough people tell me that, so I have to take it for pretty gospel. Uh, let's see. Good idea to shop around for a tank supplier, right? Yes. Very much so. Cluster heads are not very well liked by oxygen suppliers. Uh, I've heard of people that are cluster heads being cut off by their oxygen supplier, which goes to a different topic I'll discuss here momentarily. Um, my oxygen supplier used to be, my insurance covered it. I got all the tanks I wanted, didn't matter. Come get them, swap them out. And the last time I went over there, which was a couple of years ago, they basically told me I could get two E-tanks per day and it was gonna cost me $25 a tank. Well, needless to say, if I need it again, I'm gonna shop around. But I hate to say this because I don't wanna jinx myself. I have not had to hit oxygen in just about two years. The last time I had to do it was after the Denver conference. I went into a small mini cycle for about two weeks. Um, needed it then, but that was about it. I'm glad to say that right now things are good. So I haven't shopped around to tell you which major suppliers are the best or which ones don't want to service us. I will say that I wish I had one to demonstrate some people take a welding tank and fill empty medical tanks. That's not for the faint of heart. You need to do your research. If they make a transfill adapter, it's about $200. Uh, that's going to be on my link page in the PDF. And I will say that it can save you a lot of money if you were so predisposed to do something like that. I went to an oxygen facility one time where they fill medical tanks and the only difference in medical O2 and, and welding O2 is the tanks were vacuumed before they filled the medical O2. If you have imper if you have bad oxygen, you will not make a good weld and most welders won't put up with that. So I'm comfortable using it, but that doesn't mean you should be. That's a decision you need to make. And for whatever reason, if you decide to go that route, do not walk into the weather supply office and say, I want a tank because I want to breathe it. They will not sell it to you. And those are particularly good to shop around. Sometimes you rent tanks, sometimes you have to just go and buy it and have it refilled. But uh, yes, please do shop around, particularly for that avenue. Uh, next question, Mr. Tom Shelton, where do you buy oxygen tanks for welding or medical and how do you refill them? I want my own tax and tanks and bypass insurance. I think I just covered that. Uh, most towns of any reasonable size have a welding supply house or a gas 
a distributor. Uh, I'm lucky. I live next to a medium sized city that has two or three. Um, if I go into a good cycle again, I will probably buy a welding tank and transfill it like I spoke of. I have several D tanks and three E's that I will probably do that and bypass my supplier, my former supplier altogether. Um, I would not do that in perpetuity because one thing about medical tanks, when you return them and recycle them, they get pressure tested every so often as is regulation. So I wouldn't go forever like that. Uh, you can actually buy new tanks on Amazon. The last time I checked, you can buy new medical tanks. I can't remember how much they were because I wasn't interested. I picked them up on Facebook Marketplace. I picked them up on eBay. Uh, you have to be careful, though. You don't want Grandpa's old medical tank that's been sitting in the closet for 25 years because it's probably going to have a bad valve on it. And just wasted your money. So there is a plus to going to a medical supply and getting those tanks. Bill, Joe was wondering if you could hold up the demand valve. He'd like to see it again. Sure. This is a demand valve I use. Uh, it is not like most that you can get now. This was what Lynn Care was selling back about 10, 12 years ago. This is a demand valve allied products. This is the more common one. This is what most people will find or some reasonable facsimile of. But you can tell they're fairly different. This is a very nice valve, but it is almost impossible to get parts for now. So when it dies, uh, it's not going to be good. Lincare made a good attempt to sell these to cluster headache patients, but they wanted too much for them. They were asking way too much for the average person to afford. Um, so I'm stuck with one. Hopefully it'll last forever, but this is what you'll find most of right here. It'll have a hose that comes off of it, just like the stick hose screws into the regulator, operates on the same principle. Another question came up, Bill. Okay. Uh, I'm wearing a mask because Joe and I are in a small area right now. We were sure. in a large conference room, but right. um, we had to move into a smaller space, so we can't we can't distance very very far right now. So. Okay. Well, I I I'll look at people with masks all day long. Doesn't bother me. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. So Chris says he brought new e tanks on Amazon for fifty dollars each. Good price. I didn't think they were all that expensive, but if you need them, that'd be a good place to get them. Uh, Tom Shelton, who would refill medical tanks? If you're dealing with a medical supplier, they refill them. If you're not, then you have to devise a method to refill them, which is a transfill adapter. And I hope next year to have a transfill adapter that I can demonstrate at next year's conference. It's something I was going to do this year. And when I didn't think we were going to have a conference, I just kind of put off buying one because it, right now it would be for demonstration purposes, but I will be doing that next year. You can refill medical tanks from a welding tank or a big end tank from a medical supplier. That's something you'll need to Google and read about. I can't go into everything that you have to do there. It's not that difficult, but you have to be safe about it. And there are certain ways to do it. And I'm not going to get into that right now because I don't have one to demonstrate. And that's more advanced than what I've kind of tailored this to. But there are some tutorials out there on the internet that will get you started on that. Uh, how long can a tank filled with oxygen last sitting until next cycle? Well, I believe this one was filled about four or five years ago, maybe. So unless the valve goes bad and starts leaking in the tank itself, it's not going to go bad. It's there. Where I store my tanks in the basement, and that makes uh, another safety item. I want to 
say this. A lot of people have, you know, maybe six or seven tanks sitting in their basement standing up. And if you've ever knocked those over, you hold your breath that you don't knock the top off before they stop bouncing on the floor and everything. If you'll visit your local grocery store, convenience store, and sweet talk a clerk or the guy in the back, get you a two liter Pepsi or Coke crate that they come in, stick them all in there. They fit just perfect and you have your own tank for them then. You, can not, you have to work at knocking that over. It's a fantastic idea. I can't remember where I saw that, but I have two of them just outside this door uh, stacked with tanks. They never fall over. All right, I know I have not been that thorough. So, right. questions, please. I can't believe I've been that thorough. My goodness. <laughs> uh, I'll get I'll, I'll I'll give my email address, and I don't mind doing this. I give out a business card for uh, contact at a conference, so I'll feel bad doing this. My uh, my email is racer the number one underscore nc at yahoo.com. That's word racer, number one, underscore NC at yahoo.com. I will be glad to send you a PDF file, full links, uh, get you started. That's not by no means the only place you can get this stuff, but it'll get you started in the right direction. Because I know when I was searching, I just had to figure it out. I'd like to give people a little heads up. Um, uh, no, that's not my picture behind me. That's Richard Petty. Um, this is a resemblance isn't quite there, I don't think. Um, uh, can you store tanks in the garage where it gets hot? Well, I asked a respiratory therapist about storing oxygen tanks in a car sitting in a parking lot when it gets hot. Her response was, it isn't going to get that hot. The only danger that I've seen is that we will, um, the little seal over time can degrade from the temperature extremes, keep fresh, oops, keep fresh seals on it. In fact, I just dumped them so I'll show it. Keep fresh seals, that'll help. Uh, if you're just storing tanks in the garage, unless you are just north of Hades, there shouldn't be any problem. Bill, not yeah. not super unrelated to that. Um, sure. I know you live in a in a in an area that doesn't get super super cold in the winter. Yes. I, I was told by an oxygen supply medical supply company not to keep a, a tank in my car when it got super cold outside. There was she she thought that there would be a problem with the tank. So I don't uh, know if you, I, I never followed up through on or followed up on finding out about that, but. I, Maybe you can speak to that. I will say this. That tank that I've shown you, or one just like it, has been in my primary daily driver vehicle ever since I started using oxygen and started getting tanks. We've had cold snaps to below zero, obviously not Chicago winters, but we've gotten below zero. Um, I've never noticed anything other than the fact that metal shrinks when it gets cold and the regulator might be a little loose when it's 10 degrees versus when it's, if you tighten it up at 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. So I would check that. That's the only thing that I've noticed. Now, obviously I've not lived through a Midwest winter like that. So I can't say definitively, I've just not noticed any okay. problem with it. Uh, let's see. Uh, I want to make sure I've got everybody. I'll, I'll give my email address in just a second again. Safest way for smokers to use oxygen in the house. And I touched on that. I never use oxygen in a room where I was going to smoke. I didn't smoke in my bedroom. That's where I went to use the oxygen. When I went somewhere else to smoke, I let the oxygen kind of, you know, they, people some say you can get oxygen saturation in your clothes. Wait five minutes 
in another room, light up, no problem. I don't use oxygen in a room where people are smoking, period. Uh, I've seen people do it and it freaked me out. Obviously, I'm here to live to tell about it, but I don't do it. I would very strongly caution you not to do it. Uh, same effect when using the whole mask versus the breathing, the breathing piece. Absolutely. I'll get this one out to demonstrate. This is the uh, mouthpiece or the nose, the face mask that comes with the uh, O2 cluster kit. It would go on there like that. So I'm breathing in and out through this mask. Okay. I'm breathing in and out through this. I'm getting the same amount of oxygen. Plus this is not bothering me. Same thing, same aboard. Believe me, if it made a 30 second difference from being using this and using this, I would be using this and just getting freaked out and claustrophobic. You know, I'll take 30 seconds off of pain. Oh, uh, let's see. Next question. I'll, I'll go ahead and repeat the email again since a couple of people asked. Racer, the number one underscore NC at yahoo.com. And that's Racer, the number one underscore NC as in North Carolina at yahoo.com. Yeah, yeah, somebody put it up for me. Thank you. I didn't think about typing it there. Goodness. Okay, should I be cleaning the O2 mask from cluster busters? I only use the mouthpiece. If you're using a mask like this, yes. Take it apart, soak it in some just mild soapy water, Get rinse it several times, let it dry. You may have to force it a little bit. The seals may stick a little bit. Don't, you know, don't wait till you need it. Blow on them, make sure the seals are work sealing properly, letting it been late. Yeah, do clean it every once in a while. Unfortunately, there's not a good way to clean these bags. That's the one weak link in it, but keep this mouthpiece clean. It, I've never had an issue with it, but God knows you, cleanliness is not gonna hurt anything, that's for certain. Just make sure you get all the soap out of it so it doesn't attack the seals. Okay, my nephew's a firefighter. He says oxygen accelerates combustion but does not cause combustion on its own. That's absolutely correct. Best to keep your tank not in a room with any pilot lights, candles, fireplaces. Wholeheartedly agree. Wholeheartedly agree. Uh, didn't think about the pilot lights. I don't have gas in this house. But yeah, absolutely. One more. Of course, people weld in a room with oxygen tanks with the proper setup. So just use your head. It, excel it is an accelerant. It's not a, com it doesn't combust on its own, but you'd think it did by the way it acts. That's where people get that, th that from. And I will share this, these tanks can explode in a fire. So if God forbid your vehicle or your house catches on fire, tell the firefighters there's tanks in there that can explode. If you've ever seen a video of a tank exploding in a fire or there is a video of a couple, for lack of a better term, Yahoo shooting oxygen tanks on YouTube. If you've ever seen those, they'll scare the devil out of you. So your car catches on fire, tell the responders there's a tank in there. They'll appreciate it, I'm sure. Okay, I've gotten all the questions here. I think so, Bill. Okay, well, that's good. Um, if there's nothing else, no other questions, we, we will take a little break until four o'clock central time. So about 15 minutes from now. Um, Bob is finishing up his grow presentation and we will resume for the last two sessions of the day in about 15 minutes, but you can hang out in this room, in this, um, yeah, on this link. 
It's on this way. You can I was going to hang out with your room in there. I was going to go to Chicago. <laughs> you can come to this room. We're in a little. We're in a little vestibule right now. There's there's room uh, for a couple more people if we crowd together and wear masks. Okay. Well, I'll stay in here for a little bit. If somebody has questions or anything, that's fine. Okay, great. I'd be glad to uh, hang around for a few minutes until mm -hmm. uh, the next next panelist comes on. Because I'm going to get to hear the first presentation because I've been at work all day. I had to get off early to come home and do this. So I got to catch up on and get back in the groove of the convention. Bill, and I, thank you so thank much. everybody for coming. And, and I hope I've helped you out a little bit. And if you ever have any questions, use that same email address. I'll be glad to answer them if I can. So good to see you today, Bill. Good to see you too, Mark. Okay. All right, let's see. I'm assuming everybody can still hear me. Uh, if there was a house fire, is it dangerous to have the tank next to the bed? If it got hot enough to blow the tank, um, you probably wouldn't know it. <laughs> I would think you'd probably be long gone. Um, smoke won't cause it the fire would. Uh, obviously, if the house is on fire, don't turn the tank on. Get out. Uh, Joe says it's yes, it's, it's dangerous to have the tank next to the bed in a house fire, but uh, I'd hope I got out of the, the fire before it ever got dangerous for that tank. Um, let's see. What type of hose from the oxygen tank welding to cluster buster tank? Uh, if you talk about what kind of hose from a uh, welding tank to a uh, Rettiger medical tank, that comes with a transfill adapter. It looks kind of like the hose on my uh, demand valve, special pressure hose. Uh, cluster buster mask. Oh, okay, from oxygen tank welding. If you use this type of regulator right here, it's just a regular tubing. You have to be careful with these and please don't overdo it. Just crack the thing and figure out where that flow is gonna be because you can, you can really have some flow out of these more than any human being could ever take. So it just plugs in like that, just like it would on any tank using a nipple fitting like that. And Joe is sitting here being the, the, the man that he is, being a firefighter, working smoke detectors, no candles. Absolutely. Uh, do I have to buy a nipple fitting? No, they come on the uh, regulators like that. The uh, post type regulators, they come with them. This welding regulator came with a nipple fitting on it. I had, you had to assemble this time. And one thing that's neat, I'll just say this about these regulators here that you run a demand valve off of, if you got a good enough, uh, big enough tank, somebody can be aborting with that fitting and you can be aborting with this fitting. That's kind of neat. And, and people concerned about fire, they actually make a fire break. And I don't cover this because they're not exactly compatible with a 25 liter emitted reg. I don't know if you can see this in the bag. It's a fire break. And it will turn off the flow. It's all, there it is. There's my fire break. Let me get it out. I've got a loose one so you can see it better. 
fire break. They work great with 15 liters a minute. They constrict 25, but that's what they're made for. Joe, you're absolutely right. Working smoke detectors should be in every main, every level of the house. Test them at least every six months. Good CO2 detectors, good too. I've got, I have one down here in my garage slash office. Joe says he had a smoke detector in every room and I don't blame him. Yeah, I don't know why that oxygen regulator comes with a nipple fitting, but it does and it's fantastic. Sheila, that is a fantastic idea. Signs on the front doors to warn firefighters we have O2 inside. You know, I've never even thought about that. Joe, why hadn't you beat me over the head about that? I'm going to do that this weekend. How long would a welding tank last? Um, Cycles about eight weeks, three or four every day. If you can abort with high flow and not stay on it too long, goodness knows. Oh, heck, it's hard for me to say. I know an E tank, I can, as long as they're not being real stubborn, I can get uh, four or five aborts out of an E tank, maybe more. And a welding tank has considerably more in there and I don't have the leaders that it has right in front of me. Uh, you won't need one every other day, that's for certain. Probably a couple, three weeks. Absolutely, Joe, it can dry you out. You can actually, with a 15 liter a minute, have a moisturizer, they call them a bubbler, but with 25, it doesn't work all that well. Mark, are they gonna be using this room for the next presenter? Yes, we'll stay in this room. Okay, well. You are online and- um, I will shut up and mute. Okay, we'll, I, Bob, it looks like Bob is just about to finish up with his GROW presentation, so we should be able to get started right around, around four o'clock. All right, well, I will stand down. Okay, oh, wait, one question. Oh, well, is oxygen in a given size tank consistent in terms of volume? Uh, should be, yes, that's the way they're filled, that's the way they're sold. 
and thank you all for coming. And this is my way of giving back the Cluster Headache community, which has given so much to me over the years. So I'm glad I can help. And I'm going to get busy sending out those PDFs here in just a minute. <laughs> all right, I'm muting, shutting up. Thank See you. Like we'll, we'll be back in just a few minutes. We'll get started in just a moment. Just waiting for some folks to make it over to this room from the GROW presentation.
We're going to wait just one more moment and then we'll we'll get started. Okay, we are ready to get started. Um, two more, two more sessions, and two more speakers, and then Eileen will have some final announcements for the day. So um, we have another patient perspective. Um, Brian Brian Garrison is going to be speaking, and Brian lives with cluster headaches. He works for the VA as a supervisor of the Tampa Kinesiology Department. Is that right, Brian? Okay. Um, and a focus area of Brian's clinical practice is rehabilitation after traumatic brain injury. So um, Brian, I think we're all very interested in what you have to say. All right, thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Um, so um, when I was asked to talk about myself, um, I'll be honest with you, but originally I, I'm not a big person I like to talk about myself a whole lot. I'd rather figure out what's going on with everybody else. But, you know, in this form, I think it's good to share the story of uh, just, you know, my um, struggle with cluster headaches. So I'll start with beginning. Again, my name is Brian Garrison. I am 39 years old. I am originally from the big city of Jackson, Mississippi. Um, where I um, attended the University of Southern Mississippi. I also played football out there for a little while. Um, to anybody that's maybe out there on the, in the virtual world somewhere and we, we happen to beat you back in the day, I do apologize about that. But um, uh, I've been suffering with cluster headaches for almost 18 years now. Um, and uh, just listening to Bill earlier, I, I wasn't as lucky as he was to get the early diagnosis of cluster headache. Um, I spent close to almost 10 years uh, being misdiagnosed. Um, uh, my headache started a little bit just around the time I was getting ready to graduate from um, college, uh, undergrad anyway. And, you know, I started having these, these headaches and, you know, um, I was assuming it was just because, you know, maybe it's because of the studying that I was doing, maybe it's because it's final exams, you know, um, maybe the, the girlfriend that I was talking to at the time was getting on my nerves, I don't know. Um, but for whatever, whatever reason it was, I just kept having these headaches and they would happen at certain times of day and they just kept coming back over and over and over and over again. Um, but of course, you know, uh, growing up in Mississippi, that was one of the things that you can't, you can't not go to work, you can't not you know, go to class, you can't not do the things that you normally do because you got a headache. You know, that's, you know, you're, you're supposed to be a man. You got to suck it up and do what you got to do. So um, that's what I tried to do. Um, the problem was, was I, it, it didn't matter what I, what, what I did. It was, it, I continued to have these headaches and they were happening. And, you know, over time, I realized that it was a pattern to these headaches. Uh, fast forward a little bit um, to my working career. Um, like I said, I'm the supervisor, and actually, uh, it's the kinesiotherapy program at the, the VA uh, in Tampa, Florida. But initially, I started out in Memphis, Tennessee, working um, in our spinal cord injury area. So, um, obviously, uh, Department of Veteran Affairs and, and, and my veterans, um, I love those guys to death. And um, I try to do everything I can for them. And that was the reason why I started out in spinal cord injury, because you know, to see what those guys were dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, you go from being, you know, um, you know, a proud, strong man to being in a wheelchair, um, you know, that takes a lot to deal with something like that. It takes a lot to, um, to humble yourself and, you know, understand that, hey, look, things may be rough right now, but they can get better. Um, so, you know, obviously, I, I wasn't going to complain about a headache to those guys. That's just, that wasn't going to happen. So, um, I would, you know, I would do the best I could with the patients and work with them. And I used to have times during the day where I would just sit back in, in the little office area, just close the doors, 
cut off the license, just trying to get through that cluster attack the best way I could. Um, <clears throat> but at that time, I was still a commission, so that was really hard to do to plan my day like that. Um, and one day I was in the office and I did what I normally do in the mornings. Um, I would get up, go into the office. Um, and just like Bill said, I had an oxygen tank. Luckily I work at the VA, oxygen is readily available at the hospital. So um, I had an um, oxygen tank sitting next to my desk. And what I did was every morning I would put my oxygen on it and I would start working on the computer and we cut off the lights. All my coworkers were nice about it. They knew that we were gonna have lights off when the morning started. So, and they were cool with it. So that was good. Um, but I was in there with my oxygen mask on one morning and one of the doctors came in um, and uh, she was asking me why you was wrong why you had this oxygen and I told her you know I've been dealing with headaches for a long time you know I think I, I'm, they may be migraines I don't know I think they may be sinus headaches or whatever I've been told a lot of things um, and that was the first time I remember somebody even mentioning cluster headaches to me. Um, and you know, it's just one of those things that you really hear and you're familiar with a lot. So um, literally within two minutes of talking to her, she was like, I guarantee you have cluster headaches. And um, from there, I went to my doctor and it was confirmed that I do have cluster headaches. Um, so that was kind of what I say is really the start of my true journey to figure out how can I deal with these uh, cluster headaches. Um, so just real briefly, my headaches and how mine work. Um, I have headaches twice a year. Um, and they usually last eh, roughly about a month and a half to two months. Sometimes a little bit longer than that, depending on uh, the cycle. But they are they're mine are like clockwork. I'm going to have them uh, in the early part of the spring. I'll have them. And then um, I have them again uh, towards the fall. Um, what's interesting, though, is with my headaches, uh, when I moved, I was living in Tennessee, but when I moved to Florida, um, I was thinking, okay, well, maybe my headaches are going to be a little bit better here because I, went, I didn't get them at the same time. Um, but sure enough, it's because we don't really have a winter here in Florida. So um, my headache patterns changed when I moved to Florida. Um, but I still have them twice a year. And they, they, again, now that I've been in Florida for seven years, almost eight years, Again, they were like clockwork. You know, I can count them, um, count almost down to the day that they were going to start. Um, uh, they were going to start happening. So, and one of the things that I, you know, what I would try to do is mine were pretty much right on time. I didn't have to set an alarm in the morning. Um, you know, about five thirty, six o'clock in the morning, I would get up with a headache. That was just how I began my day. Um, you know, usually I would deal with that headache. And I was supposed to be at work at eight o'clock. Um, so what I would do is I would get in the car, put my glasses on, and I'll try to get into the office as quick as I can because I know I'm going to have another headache around eight o'clock, 830. Um, so I would get into the hospital and then, of course, I start my routine, cut off the lights again. My coworkers and everybody else that worked with me, they were very, very nice about understanding. Hey, he, that's Brian. That's what he does. He, he cuts off all the lights and he'll be fine. He'll come out and he'll laugh and joke with everybody in a few minutes. Uh, even my patients knew about it. My patients would come in and they'd be like, oh, I'll wait another 15 minutes because I know Brian has a headache right now. So I'll wait a few more minutes until we go and see him. Um, so that, that would happen. And then usually around lunchtime, which was kind of convenient for me because it was a break time for me. So I would have another cluster attack then. Uh, so what I would do is I would, you know, finish up my last patient treatment and I would go into the office and I cut off the lights again. Um, and I'll try to get through that, uh, that particular attack. And usually those attacks, my attacks usually last around 45 minutes to an hour. So I have about 15, five to 15 minutes to eat my lunch before I go back to start uh, treating patients again. Um, and then in the evening time, just about it was time, about time to get off work um, is when I would have another headache. Um, and then in the evening time, I would have another headache around eight o'clock. So that was usually my, that was my, just my routine every time. I was in the cluster cycle. Um, one of the interesting things that I do um, with the VA um, that is, I'm probably pretty sure maybe not too many people on this call even have even heard of it before. Um, I'm what they call a certified driver rehab specialist. And what that is, is I teach people um, how to drive again after they've had a, a traumatic injury. So say if they had a spinal cord injury or if they had an amputation or if they um, you know, if they had a traumatic brain injury, if they um, 
have some type of neurological disorder like AL, ALS or MS or muscular dystrophy, some of those different conditions, I teach those patients how to drive or operate a vehicle again. So uh, one thing in particular that was kind of interesting and funny for me is, um, you know, when I'm in the car, you know, and my, my headaches are just like everybody else's, you know, mine happened on the right, head, right head, my right side of my head. So my right eye's drooping and I got water running out of my eye and all of that. And I'm in the car trying to ride with this patient and teach them how to drive again. So you can imagine how scary that is. First of all, if you got, if you're in the car with somebody with no legs and you can't see because your head is pounding so bad. So I literally had to learn how to prepare and plan around my headaches to do that type of training with the patients. So that was, uh, you know, and I've done that for a long time. Um, so even though I had the diagnosis of cluster headaches, I really didn't have a true modality to treat it other than the oxygen. So my thing was uh, when I got into work, the oxygen helped me. That's what I used. That was my, um, that was my treatment, but um, it was not anything. I had it at home for a little while. Um, I wish I would have known Bill probably 18 years ago. I would have probably been a lot better at uh, taking care of these headaches than, than, I, uh, than I have been. But, um, you know, <clears throat> I, I had oxygen at home, but it didn't really, didn't use it well, you know, didn't work well for me the way I, um, the way I wanted it to. It didn't abort the headaches the way uh, I wanted to because they, I didn't have the right equipment inside the home. That was my fault and I didn't check on that. But again, it's one of those things where I, I was being a little bit hard-headed. Um, I probably around, I moved to Tampa in 2013, uh, 2014, I found a new neurologist down here in Florida that I started working with. Um, and, um, again, you know, we tried everything we could to, to help with the headaches. Um, that was the first time I heard of cluster busting before. Um, and I had no idea it was all these people out here to deal with the same thing I was dealing with. Felt like I was the only person in the world that dealt with something like that. And, you know, you kind of feel like that sometimes because you don't I mean your headaches are not like everybody else. You know, somebody has a migraine, they have a migraine for two days straight and then they're fine felt, you know, for, for however long. But people ask me, well, just an hour ago, you had this pounding headache, but now you're up laughing and joking and talking with us again. Now, I don't know how you do that. Um, so it was, it was kind of relieving to, to, to hear other stories about people and, and how they are, you know, how they deal with and how they uh, have been dealing with their headaches for so long. Uh, but my neurologist actually, um, you know, we, we tried a bunch of different modalities to try to treat the headaches, but um, although I did find some relief, some things did help uh, somewhat abort the headaches. Uh, some of the um, sub Q uh, injections that I was doing, you know, they would help out with that particular attack. But, you know, again, if you have five of them a day, you know, you don't want to stick yourself five times a day just to kind of get through the day. So most of the time I sucked it up and dealt with it, just like I've done with, you know, dealt, all, dealt with it all my life. Um, but she did mention this, this headache trial and all of this stuff. And I'll be honest with you, if somebody tell me you're going to be in a, a medical study, a trial, something like that, I think I'm going to grow another arm or something like that. So I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. But eventually she, you know, she convinced me to do it. Actually, to be honest with you, my, my mother actually convinced me more than she did uh, just because she got sick of me coming home for Christmas every year and, year and hiding out in the, the bedroom half the time. So um, I did go through the, the headache trial and, and this was one of the first times, or this was the first medication uh, through uh, Eli Lilly that had, um, that triggered or targeted cluster headaches specifically. Um, so of course I went through it, I tried it, and actually it, 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 it worked for me. Um, again, I still get the headaches, um, I still deal with them, but now they're, because of, you know, I have a, a treatment modality, I'm not dealing with them as much as I've dealt with them in the past, um, because they're more regulated. Um, so uh, like, I, when I, like I said, when I first started, one of the things that I realized is that I was planning my day around my headaches. I mean, all of my patient care, all of the stuff that I was doing, I was planning it around my headaches. But now um, I have a little bit more flexibility in, in what I'm doing um, as far as being able to plan my day out of different things like that because I'm taking this medication. I'm, I'm not sticking myself five times a day. I do it uh, one time at the beginning of the month and, you know, I'm okay after that. You know, I'm, my headaches are basically cut in half. Um, and that's a lot. I mean, and I know some people... And would say, well, 
what in the world is, you know, you still having headaches? How is that helpful? Well, if you had, you know, if you were having 60 of them a month and then now you're having 30, that's a big difference. I mean, that's life changing, you know, to, to be able to say that, hey, I just cut these headaches in half and be able to deal with things and I can do things that, um, that I haven't been able to do before. I'm a big, big football fan. I love football. Um, and one of my headache cycles happens during um, football season. So usually, um, you know, I'm sitting there trying to enjoy the game, um, you know, over the last couple of years, crying about the Saints getting beat, uh, blowing the game um, like they've done like the last couple of years. But um, that pain actually probably hurts more than the headache to watch them lose, but that's beside the point. Um, but just being able to enjoy, you know, going to a game or hanging out with my friends, um, I have, I'm really, really involved with uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters here in Tampa. I have a little that I, um, that I, I work with and I spend time with. And, um, you know, it, it is very interesting to, to hear a nine-year-old's perspective on life. Um, and, you know, he knows about my headaches now. And, and it's funny how they can even sense the difference in how I'm acting and how I'm, um, and how I'm, you know, able to interact with him more than I used to. Um, so all of those things are just um, the highlights of, you know, where I've been and where I've come from. Um, so that's kind of my story in a nutshell. I'm not going to talk too much about it. I'll give a few minutes to, um, for a few questions about uh, my headaches and maybe some of the treatment modalities that I've used. Uh, one of the questions I did have for the group, though, is, uh, first of all, uh, how many um, people have had more than, so your cluster cycles, how many people have more than one cluster cycle um, a year? And, that's, and I guess people can put responses in um, the chat box on that. But that was one of the things that I, I found interesting is, if, even with cluster headaches, I have a friend that I found out that had cluster headaches as well, and he would have, uh, his cluster headaches would happen every three to four years. Um, and, and of course, when he had it, he, it would last him about a month and it was gone after that. Um, but uh, he even questioned, you know, he's like, I don't know how you do, do it as much as you have, but um, it, it's, I just think it's interesting to see how many people uh, have more, uh, or what their cycle pattern is, should I say. Uh, so see one person here, I have one, uh, plus the cycle from September to January every year. That's football season. That's a <laughs> chronic brain, high cycle spring, fall. Okay, that's the same time of year I, I have them. Two cycles every year. Um, two cycles a year. Chronic brain. Um, stop. That is a very interesting one. So now I did hear about some people that um, they never come out of the cluster cycle. And I sympathize with you. Um, Jonathan, that, that I wouldn't wish this on my worst uh, enemy. Um, and I wouldn't even wish this on Dallas Cowboy fan. And that's, that's how bad these headaches are. But I hate the Cowboys, obviously. Um, and I wouldn't even want them to have cluster headaches. I want them to lose a lot, but not, um, not have cluster headaches. Um, fingers crossed it's been three years. Wow. OK. That's good. So quite a few people that are chronic. Um, they go on and on. So that is, I know that's very difficult to deal with. So the next question I guess I'll have too is, I know some people, you know, and I honestly, I've never had a migraine before. Um, I can't remember ever having a migraine, never, you know, I'm, especially now knowing the difference between the two, I've never had a, a, a migraine before. So um, particularly for your cluster headaches, how many, you know, and we'll use a classic scale of one to 10, they always ask you, um, the pain scale of how bad does the cluster headache hurt, um, which, what would you say, and we can just have everybody put numbers in here, um, as far as the pain level, 10 being the worst thing that you've ever felt in your life, and one being very moderate, how would you describe your, um, how would you describe your headaches? And we also have a vocational rehab uh, person here. That, so I'm pretty sure you're very familiar with uh, the auto adaptive program and, and driver rehab. So we got a lot of tens, seven to 10. 
10 plus. And so, and the reason why I wanted to ask this question is because, I mean, I, I deal with, again, like we said, we started, I deal with a lot of patients that have spinal cord injury, um, a lot of patients with traumatic brain injuries, and a lot of other, uh, you know, comorbidities with, with being injured and being uh, in the military. Um, and we use the pain scale all the time. And it is interesting to see how many people deal with that type of headache, pain having, uh, you know, classifying headaches as a team. Um, and I've had a team before, so I know exactly um, what you, what everybody means with that. And I know with my particular headaches and the way my cycle goes, I can tell when it's coming on. Um, usually when they start, they're, they're just mild, dull, little headaches. And within a week, um, I'm at a team. Um, and each different, each separate attack is a team every single time. And it, it is, it is excruciating pain. So um, again, all of, all of the people that own this call that deal with cluster headaches, I, I sympathize with you. Uh, you know, I, I fight this journey with you and I know it's not easy at all to, to deal with, um, with, the, with these headaches and especially dealing with the severity of the pain. Um, and you know, it, it, takes a, it takes some special people to deal with this and continue to go about your day because, I mean, you have so many different attacks. Um, you can't let that stop your life. So um, it, it is amazing to see how many people, like I said, through cluster busters that are dealing with and, and living productive lives and, and in the shadows dealing with something so painful. Um, so the, let's see, prank migraine since 16. And the last question that I have is, how long has everybody been dealing with uh, cluster headaches? So again, um, I, I've been dealing with them for 18 years. So I was about 24 years old at the time I first um, started having cluster headaches. So we'll put, put that in the uh, chat box as well. 34 years, wow, 45. Got some people that have been dealing with cluster headaches longer than I've been living. Wow, that's, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Um, my mom's had cluster headaches for over 30 years, 16 years, probably uh, 23, 26, 26, 10 years of chronic, over 20 years, 21 years, 40 years, wow. wow. H10, so twenty-seven years, 53 years. And for Tom with the 53, looks like Tom has the been dealing with them the longest. I'm not sure if we have any, I didn't see anybody that was over 53 years. So one of the things that I found that's interesting, um, especially working in healthcare and working with people that have traumatic brain injuries, obviously one of the, the byproducts of a traumatic brain injury is headaches. Um, so I have a lot of patients that deal with headaches. Um, so being able to talk to them and, and kind of get their story on how they, how they dealt with headaches and how they've been dealing with headaches over um, so long has been, um, it, it is actually helpful for me as well. Um, but I can't even imagine dealing with cluster um, headaches for 53 years. And as we all know, um, technology and, and what we know about headaches in general has changed a lot of the years. So uh, the treatment back in the day, I can't even imagine. I, I, how, what was the treatment like 53 years ago for cluster headaches? What would, you, what would you do for a cluster headache 53 years ago? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, <laughs> Lobotomy. <laughs> that, 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 and have a drink, I guess, basically. I mean, and also drinking does hurt the headaches and makes it worse sometimes. Um, but <laughs> I can't even imagine uh, dealing with uh, headaches from a, a long time ago. I mean, that Aspirin is probably uh, the, the most the most advanced technology you had to treat a headache back then. So uh, that <laughs> I like the leeches leeches approach. I mean, that's kind of what they. Well, I mean, 53 years ago, that's almost a stone age anyway. So um, that <laughs> that's old school years ago, especially being woman misdiagnosed. So yeah, it's nothing. Yeah, yeah. So the, the the misdiagnosis is one of those things that. Um, 
uh, I've dealt with for quite a while, and I can't even imagine dealing with it as long as some of, some of you all have um, with this. An interesting one is ice pack. I know uh, some people have said that they, you know, if they can put their head in a cooler or, uh, you know, I've actually tried to use a, a cold pack around my head a couple of times to, to help out with the headaches and, and those things actually, um, they do help with it some. Um, and again, Tom, like you said, change, plus of us changing his mindset and having the oxygen. Um, and too many leeches trying in the day, that's, that's another good one as well. Frozen bag of peas. Frozen bag of peas has been one that I've used the most. That was my go-to. Um, was and if, if the headache was bad enough, I'd just stick my head in the freezer with the uh, frozen peas until until it at least get get subside enough for me to go back into the bedroom and hide away. Um, one of the things that I will say um, about cluster headaches, and I know we got I got two minutes here. Um, one one thing that I will say about the cluster headaches that um, that really made me want to find some way of at least treat myself and, and making sure that I was at least a little bit better was the effect that you have on other family members. I know we got a caregiver perspective that's gonna come up here in a few minutes, but um, how much it affects the other family members around you. Um, you know, me with my, um, my, my mother and my father and, um, and the, the kid that I mentor, my girlfriend, like all of these people trying to um, you know, they want to be there for you and they want to help you and there's nothing they can do about it. And just, you know, looking at, you know, looking at your mother, your, your kids or whoever that is there that's with you, the loved ones and them watching you suffer. Um, that is, that actually probably hurts me more than it actually the pain itself because nobody wants to see your loved ones suffer. Um, so I want to just close by saying thank you. Um, for Cluster Buses for setting this website up for all of us to come in and tell our stories, some of the things that we, you know, that we've dealt with, some of the things that we're going through, um, you know, success stories for, you know, things that have helped us along the way. Um, and we'll continue to work together to hopefully uh, get this thing under control the way, the way it needs to. So I will write on time, 5.30, well, it's 5.30 here. I know it's 4.30 everywhere else, but um, that is my story in a nutshell. I, I hope I didn't talk too long or uh, bore you too much with it. There was nothing boring about your story. I'm so happy to meet you today, Brian. Um, you. You know, you, what you shared with us, I think, probably reminds many of us about how it was when we were wondering what was going on at first. You know, we, oh, it's a migraine. It's some other kind of neurological situation or other type of headache. Nobody knows what cluster headache is until they're diagnosed with it, you know. Um, so, and and nobody's met. Most of us haven't met another person with cluster headache until we go to a conference. You might experience people virtually or in the chat forums, but to meet somebody face to face doesn't usually happen until you get together. You, you attend your first conference, and then it's sort of an overwhelming experience. You're you're understood and you understand, you know. Um, and uh, and I, I really appreciated what you had to say about adapting to the pain, um, finding ways to continue to, to live your life, but, but behaving as though there wasn't something outrageous going on. I mean, we've, I think we've all done that. We've sat through that driving lesson when we should have been, you know, banging our head against a wall somewhere or, you know, something. But, but so I think we, many of us have, have been in situations where we just find ways to adapt to the pain and also find ways to, um, uh, well, not find ways, but I think you talked about the, the, the pain number, the KIPP scale, and it occurred to me, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, somebody said there's no such thing as a 10 plus. And there may not be a 10 plus, but 10 may be on a continuum. You know, I thought I had a 10 and then I had some, uh, another attack that was like, how could it have been worse than the previous one? But it was, and they were both 10s, 